Hello, everyone. Oh, yay, applause. <laughs> it's so good to see you all here. Um, thank you so much for coming. Go ahead and grab your seats. Um, and if you're still uh, having a few bites, please feel free to go ahead and keep eating through the service. Uh, yes, if you're welcome to take pictures, please take the flash off of the pictures. Yeah, really. Um, so thank you all so much for coming today. Smoking, mm, what do you think? What do you think? Mm, what is this, the 1970s? Um, <laughs> Um, thank you all for being here in this amazing place. I, would, I was saying to myself yesterday during our rehearsal that it feels like this is a sacred event, even though it's not a religious event. Um, so for those of you who were able to go to the funeral mass this morning, it, that was extraordinary. It was very moving. Um, and thank you all for coming here, uh, a gathering of what I like to call the theater side of the family, uh, for those of us who have made our life in the theater, as Philip always called it. Um, it feels so wonderful to gather with you all. Um, so, and I, I know that he would be pleased to see this collection, a very distinguished artist. If you can just picture in your mind what Philip looked like whenever he walked into a room that had his dear friends and artists in there with him, I think that that is how he would feel walking into this room today. Um, my name is Susan Stroop. Um, I met Philip in 2009 when I was a first year student at Towson's MFA program, which is how many of us here in Baltimore met him. Uh, I moved to Baltimore to attend that program and have stayed ever since. I became Philip's graduate assistant in 2010 and stayed with him for a few years during school. Um, and even though after I finished working with him at that time, I officially wasn't with CITD, I think many of you know the feeling that once you were in <laughs> Philip's orbit, you were never really out of Philip's orbit. <laughs> and at any moment, you might get a phone call and a long voicemail if you didn't pick up, if you answered, and Philip would have an idea or something or he just wanted to check in or he saw something that reminded him of you. Um, and he wanted to tell you about that. So um, I'm, I'm part of that. Um, and then last fall, I officially rejoined CITD again, uh, what felt like at now, looking back, very providential moment um, to help he and Carol in this last part of their journey. Um, and I'm now going to be the legacy and communications manager for CITD, which we'll talk about later. <laughs> Susan really did so much for Philip over the years. Uh, I'm Yuri Urnov. Uh, I've met Philip in year 2000 in Moscow. Uh, and uh, I just say it once, but I, I do actually think he, he did save my life and the life of my wife. I don't know where I would have been now uh, if I didn't move here with his help, with a lot of his help. There were a lot of people involved, but Philip certainly led that. Uh, so he did this to me. and. <laughs> right, this is why I'm here, and uh, yeah, talk to me about smoking, I know a lot about that. Yes, Yuri always knows where the good doors are to go out and smoke, not, just wait till after the program though. Um, so we have a, a couple of things we want to talk about before we get started with our program of storytelling. Um, as we said, this is a celebration of life. It, we are here in remembrance, we are here in our own grief journeys, but we are also here in joy uh, and the artistry of being in theater. So first, we'd like to start by welcoming you to this special place. If this is your first time here or your thousandth time here, welcome. Uh, the Baltimore Theater Project was founded by Philip Arnault in 1971 as an extension of his work with Antioch College. Carol Bache joined early on as the managing director, as many people have talked about. It wouldn't have run without either of them. Uh, and the two turned the theater project into a renowned space for free, experimental, international theater. Philip and Carol built their life into this theater. Uh, and all throughout it, you can see the fruits of their labor and many others, including in the bathrooms, where you can see a history of the theater project lining the walls of both of the bathrooms. Uh, we're gathering here today because this was the place where Philip found his strength as a connector and as a person who understood the power of what happens when you bring people together to tell stories. And tonight will be all about storytelling. We just asked people, you know, tell us your stories about Philip, and then we received a lot of videos and 
a lot of people came today to share them. So we had to select a few, some. Uh, but we'll, we're working on the project where there will be a page dedicated to Philip's memory where all these videos will live happily and forever. And we'd like to give a special, a special welcome to those who have joined us near and far via our live stream. Uh, so let's give a round of applause to welcome everyone who's tuning in virtually. And uh, thank you to VJ Matthew and the HowlRound team for making the connection possible and to Lola Pearson for acting as our host for today. Okay, to start the things off, uh, Ellison, will you please come and do your thing? Ellison, Philip's daughter. Yes. Got my dad's button on right here. I was, I was six years old in 1971 when my father founded the Baltimore Theater Project. I remember walking home from Grace and St. Peter's Elementary School, and I say walking home, I would walk here to the theater project. And I'd walk up the stairs and I'd hang out for the rest of the evening in this playground. If you remember, there were not seats, there were risers, there were trees and platforms that myself and Michael, Terry, and Sean and I loved to climb. At night, after a long day, Carol, my stepmother, would be standing at the bottom of those stairs with our dog Charlie and her arms laden with grant applications. <laughs> and in exasperation, she would say, start whining, let's get your dad out of here. <laughs> and I would climb back up the stairs and I would tug on that giant molten belt buckle of his and get him home. The theater project has been home to incredible artists from around the world, a world that my father made smaller with all the amazing connections that he forged. He was the great connector. And thank you for joining in the celebration of my dad. Thanks. Hi, I am uh, Chris Fingston. I am the current um, producing director of Theater Project. I'm going to try to get through this without choking up. <laughs> Theater Project is like a small family business. In our 53 years of existence, we've only had four people that have run it. <laughs> and all of us have long histories here. Uh, but it's not just us as individuals, it's also our families as well. Um, I mean, I'm sure Alice was just talking about spending time here and, uh, and probably being put to work at some point, as well as uh, Carol's kids, too, were all working here at some point. And our, uh, my predecessor, who's sitting right up there, started here as a volunteer, as a teenager in the 1970s. And uh, as she took over as uh, the director, she worked alongside her husband, Tucker. And her kids worked here as well. Um, I began here in the early 80s when we were renovating the place. And sorry, took the scaffolding out and actually put seats in. Um, and uh, and that's, where, that's when I started. My wife, who's sitting right up there, also worked here in the 80s. And my kid has worked here. And uh, Anne's son, James, still fills in at the box office on occasion. So like I said, it's it's... It's family. Um, Philip was always dad. Yeah, even though he was no longer involved in running the company, he was always engaged with us, just like a dad. He would, he would offer his opinions, wanted or not. <laughs> he would give his advice. Uh, he, would, he, he, would, he would encourage us. And, um, and it wasn't just us who were working here. It was also with the artists as well. Now, he loved coming here. He really did. He loved bringing people here, especially international artists. I would get a call from him ahead of time saying, I have this guy from, uh, he runs a theater in Bulgaria. I want to show him around. 
And, uh, and so he'd come here, show him around. He loved telling stories about Theater Project. Now, he had reserved seats when he was here. It, second row right there on the end. That's where he sat, sometimes by himself. Sometimes Carol was with him. Sometimes we had to block off the entire row for all the people that he would bring. And um, after the show, he would always hang around. He would stay here so he could have a conversation, have a chat with the artists, and, and offer them advice, offer them encouragement and, and his insight. And um, that's what he was. They were like kids. They were his kids. So, you know, he was here only a couple of months before he passed. And he, he always would come, even if it was a struggle, he would always try to come and see stuff here. And he will always be part of Theater Project. He built this place. And all, we're gonna terribly miss him. He will always, his presence will always be felt here, always. Uh, this plaque was given to us by the family. It's got a lovely picture and uh, a little bit of information about Philip. And um, we are going to uh, place this on the wall outside the entrance to this, to this wonderful theater that he just loved. And um, from now on, it will be known as the Philip Arno Stage at Theater Project. Thanks, Dad. So now welcome everyone to the Philip Arno stage at the Baltimore Theater Project. So we are going to start our stories uh, hearing from some of some uh, parts of Philip's life and some stories from, uh, I won't say the old days, let's say the early days of the theater project. Uh, we're going to start with John Strasbaum. Hey, great to see so many people here. This is great. Um, if you don't know who I am, I helped Philip and Carol run the place from 1978 through 1982. In 1990, I moved to New York City, and I've done a lot of newspaper writing and book writing. Um, during his last year or so, uh, I helped Philip work on his memoirs. Um, he ran out of time for that. Um, geez, sorry. So I've been asking some of his friends to help me finish it, and I'll continue to do that. Um, a week ago, Brandis asked me if I could do a three-minute summary of Philip's life, and I said yes. <laughs> it was only later that I said, wait, what, no, no. Um, but it was too late. So here's what I got, and I'll ask his friends to fill in. When Philip was born in Memphis, Tennessee, on April 19th, 1941, an astrologer friend of his family did the chart. The first line was, the male child Philip will be a man of the theater and of public service who says astrology is inaccurate. <laughs> he did his first acting in high school because, he told me, theater was where the girls were. He continued to act at Memphis State, at Memphis's Front Street Theater, and in grad school at Catholic University in Washington. He also started to direct. Along the way, he met and married his first wife, Barbara. In 1965, they went to Germany where he directed theater for U.S. soldiers stationed there. Allison was born there. Returning to the U.S., he was teaching at Antioch College's campus in Columbia when he founded this place in 1971. Over the next 20 years, he masterminded a unique mix of cutting-edge and community-based theater, resonant ensembles, turn the page, more than 350 national and international performance residencies, community projects, and training programs. He played instrumental roles in networking smaller theaters around the country, which was a passion of his, as you know. He co-directed the New Theater Festival in 1976 and the Theater of Nations Festival in 1986. His second wife, Carol Bache, became his partner in running the theater and his other work in 1974. In 1976, he met Martha Quagne, 
of the International Theater Institute. He went on to serve as a board member of the ITI's US Center, president of ITI's new theater committee, and to be named a UNESCO World Theater Ambassador. In 1991, he left Theater Project and founded the Center for International Theater Development, CITD, as a way to make and nurture connections among artists internationally. Through ITI and CITD, he worked by his own count with artists in 87 countries, including Russia, Eastern and Western Europe, East Africa, and the Americas. When Putin invaded Ukraine in February 2022, Philip and his longtime partner in Russian projects, John Friedman, created the Worldwide Ukrainian Play Readings Program. By January of this year, there had been over 500 readings and events in 40 countries, including 139 in the US, raising roughly half a million dollars for Ukrainian artists. The last time I spoke to Philip was this past June. He called me from his bed at Stellamar, Stellamaris Hospice with something urgent he needed to dictate to me. The night before, oops, turn the page, he had watched the annual Tony Awards. His friends at the Wilma Theater in Philadelphia won for best regional theater, but it wasn't announced in the show. He dictated to me an open letter to the Tony administration <laughs> on, quote, better ways to champion local theaters around the country. Right? That was June 18th, and he left us on June 30th. So he was working all the way along. So that's what I got, and I'm looking to you all to fill in. Um, I, now we're going to have uh, we're going to hear from Livia Drapkin Vanover and Bill Vanover. Thank you all. Greetings, everybody. I'm Livia Drapkin Vanover, and Bill's going to get his banjo. Yeah. And we first met Philip when we were performing here at the Theater Project in 1973. We were on the free theater circuit. We performed here. We performed at the P P P Pittsburgh 99 Cent Floating Theater, directed by Richard Menon, who's here today, and at the Wilma Project. We followed Nora Guthrie and Ted Rotante, who had performed here before us and told us about it. And we, Philip had invited us to become the resident dance company. We were dance and music. And we just couldn't leave upstate New York, but we always felt like the Theater Project was our second home. So here's a Pete Seeger song. Pete was very close. We were very close with Pete. And we thought, Pete left the planet 10 years ago, and we'll sing this in honor of I feel like this fits Phil like a glove. That's just tuning. Get, get your voices ready, because you'll have to join in the second time around. To my old brown earth and to my old blue sky I'll now give these last few molecules of I and you who sing and you who stand nearby I do charge you not to cry. Guard well our human chain. Mark well you keep it strong as long as sun will shine. And this our home Keep pure and sweet and green, for now I'm yours, and you are also mine. To my old brown earth, 
to my old brown earth and to my old blue sky and to my old blue sky I do charge you not I to cry no. I do no, what? Almost. no I'll now give these, these last few molecules of I I'll now give I'll now give these last few molecules of I and you who sing and you who sing and you who stand nearby and you who stand nearby I do charge you not to cry I do charge you not to cry guard well our human chain Guard well our human chain. Mark well you keep it strong. Mark well you keep it strong. As long as sun will shine. As long as sun will shine. And this our home. And this our home. Keep pure and sweet and green. Keep pure and sweet and green. For now I'm yours. For now I'm yours, and you are also mine, and you are also mine. I first came to Baltimore Theatre Project in the mid to late 70s as a teenager. And, you know, it really didn't look anything like this. You came up and it was just this big open space. There was scaffolding, there were cushions, and changed depending on what the show. And the shows that I saw as a kid, as a teenager, they were eye-opening. They were amazing to me. And I distinctly remember the presence of somebody called Philip Arnaud. Well, over the years, uh, my relationship with Philip has been that uh, he has been my boss, he has been my colleague, he has been my friend, <laughs> he has been a pain in the ass occasionally. Stories about this place in all the time that I've been here, in all the time that our lives interweaved with each other, I get a million of them. Ghosts, believe you me, ghosts in every theater. But I have often said that the Baltimore Theatre Project has been my graduate school. The companies that were here, everything that I saw, the things that Philip shared with me, the things that I learned from him, this really feeds me and my work to this day. One of the first things I ever did here at the Theatre Project was build a scale model. They were still raising money for the renovations and Philip came to me and hired me to build a one-inch scale model where you took the ceiling off and you saw this room and the seats. You took this level off and you saw Ethel's place down below. I don't know where that went. It's somewhere here with the ghosts. But Philip, I'm going to miss him. I miss him greatly. I've learned a lot. Even though maybe two or three years would pass and when we would come back together, it's like we'd never stop talking to each other. In fact, there are folks today that tell me that I'm beginning to look a little like Philip. Well, you, I'm very proud of this time. Did you hear that? I've been watching it. Ghosts. Philip, I miss you. And now we are deeply privileged to have, ooh, deeply privileged to have Joyce Scott and Kayla Wall Muhammad of the amazing, incomparable Thunder Thigh Review, who are going to come tell us a little bit about their, their time at the Theater Project. Come on up. Ow, ow, ow. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Joyce J. Scott, and this is... Oh, Kayla Wall. Yeah. Muhammad. Thank you. We're here to talk about, you know, our short period of time, many long years, with Phil Arnault. I want to do a little something. Yeah, make it little. My head. 
Philip, I don't know. I started working with Helen and Barry and the late Derek Neal for a project that he came up with called the Rat Squad. And it was about eradicating rats in Baltimore City, which we have a rough time with. It was brilliant. And that was the late 80s for a summer job. And, and once you saw the relationship, you would get hooked. They had the Circus Project, Baltimore Voices. It was a beautiful. And a group of female friends that I had was called Kaumba. And Phil called us and said, listen, I got a chance for you guys to go to Amsterdam. <laughs> Are you in? You know damn well we were in. Amsterdam. <laughs> so we, he thought this was a great fit, and it was. We had a ball. I'm telling you. Then the meeting of Joyce Fat Scott. I'm sorry, is that your middle name? Very Joyce close. Fat Scott. And I'm telling you, what made this wonderful, and he had such good vision to know who would come together and make a great time. I think he, he, he mentioned that. And remember that, Joyce? Help me think. And you would make all the props and all the brilliance, and we would go and hang out with Phil, whatever, whatever country we're in. Remember we went to Scotland? Oh, yeah. We did the uh, priest, the Fringe Festival. Uh, Phil made us go on the train from the airport. We had a life-size refrigerator, and we had to drag all of our own props. Uh, there's a story about uh, Phil. I'm going to tell it, but I won't tell the dirty part. So I tell Phil, the dirty part. Phil got really drunk one night after we were coming home from the show, Kay and I. And, I and like, we are walking down the street. It's late, and Phil is yelling about having li liaisons with his wife. And he's just yelling and his feet. kissing her. Carol! It was just very scary because, you know, <laughs> two black women, we were sure we were going to get, get locked up. Right? It was so always our going, fault. We get like two blocks away from the house. And this is when Phil was really big and he had the thing swinging and he walked like this. He didn't even go. Were those are the testicles that were making him I something? would never say that, but oh. they were a testament. To, anyway, two blocks away from the house, Kay takes off and leaves. After that, I was doing a North and Papa Road. Okay, that's how I had to drag young Philip. He was so drunk up the steps in the next morning, he didn't remember anything. And then remember when he sent us to the Backdoor Festival in Holland, it was a colored festival, i.e. the Backdoor, you remember that? That was before N.A. for me, so I remember a lot. <laughs> that was before Narcotics that Anonymous. That true. So I don't know. Well, I mean, you know, we were there during Christmas, so we got to see Santa Claus, oh. which is Santa Claus, and Swarta Pete, which is Black Pete. Just another situation for us. And lots of little white, blonde kids in blackface. That wasn't easy for us. <laughs> but it was fun. It was fun. I, I just want to say thank you very much, Phil Arno. Um, the last time I saw him was on an airplane. I'm going west. He's going to Poland again. And he was also very, very helpful on my last show at the Baltimore Museum of Art because there's a whole section in the catalog on our performance, and Phil filled in a lot of info. He do so much. He did know a lot. We love Phil. We love him, and his energy will be forever. And Phil! Phil Arno, what was his last name? Arno. Oh, Shut uh, up. Phil Arno, and to the, the family of film. The best Phil. family of film or Phil? It was the film of Phil. Phil, oh, the we film love of you. Phil. Get off the Get film. out, get out. I told you this wasn't going to work. You know, I know. Hello. I'm Ann Bogart, a theater and opera director, and I'm speaking now to celebrate our mutual friend, Philip Arnault. How to do that in 90 seconds? Impossible. But I will say how I first met him when I was an undergraduate at Bard College, and he arrived looking like a full human being already, having lived a lifetime. I mean, we're talking about 1970 or something, and he came to see the work of a friend of mine, David Schechter, who had directed a piece called The Seabirds of Isabella, based on the music of uh, Bartok. It was a beautiful piece. Philip came to see it. I'm not sure why he came. And then he took us all out to dinner, and he invited David and his company to go to Baltimore, to the theater project, and perform there. Amazing. 
And so that was my introduction to Philip as somebody who was generously reaching out, interested in others, curious, and supportive, and starting their career off with a bang, with that invitation. And that's what I will carry with me forever, is the generosity of Philip. And I am sending love in the direction of everybody who's gathered together to celebrate him. Done. Okay, here you go. I met Philip Arnaud in 1976 at Baltimore when he, where he organized the new uh, theater festival, which was a massive theatrical event. But what I found the most impressive is not the American presentations there, but the fact that Philip had managed to be to visit Poland before and find the most interesting, most exciting, uh, young theaters, which he managed to bring to Baltimore before anybody had heard of them. And I think this is characteristic of Philip throughout his life. He followed Polish theater and the new developments throughout his life. When we had a break out of new theater creators in the 90s, Philip was there, he spotted them, he made friends with them, and he made sure that the Americans learn about them. And I think that the final step in this following of Polish theater by Philip was his new project, his last project, Linkages, which continues, which is his heritage, and which is based on bringing American creators to see Polish creators, meet them, and bring the Polish creators over to America because Philip always wanted to share his discoveries with his fellow citizens. Hi there, um, I'm Jim Nicola. Um, I think I wrote something that I don't know, we'll see. Um, <clears throat> uh, to my mind, Philip was, above everything else, an artist. And I use that word um, very carefully and deliberately. It's a word that means a lot to me. Of course, he did play a few other roles in his life. Loving husband, devoted father, loyal friend. But to me, his creative practice was what I knew best, and in my opinion, the role in which he achieved virtual sainthood. <clears throat> the peculiar thing about Philip's creative enterprise was that it was nigh on to invisible, at least as I perceived it. Those of us, though those of us who could perceive it, or were perhaps an element of the work he created and painted, we could be nothing but awed and inspired by his passion and his brilliance. The equivalent of his poetry, his photographic portraits, his dimensional collages, his animated novels, his creative output remained ineffable to the uninitiated. But I now stand before you to attest to the profound impact of his work and his mammoth creative imagination. And I pay homage to the revolutionary consequences of this man's life's work. Recently, I was having a post-performance feedback session with a favorite solo performer working on a new piece. Um, the particular still evolving version I witnessed that night was particularly vivid and delicious and had reached a kind of uh, intimacy and power that it had not done in previous versions. The piece is autobiographical in a way that many solo performance pieces are, and my appreci pre appreciation for this accomplishment is that both the writing, conceiving, and the performance are equally masterful. Often one of the other elements outshines the other, but on this occasion, this woman achieved new heights Heights comparable to what I am talking about in Philip's work, an ineffable, ineffable, elusive wonderment. Most solo performances end up being an amusing or harrowing tale, a sharing of an individual's experience. The audience's sympathy or amusement is the object. But this piece that I am talking about, this time, was different. The sharing of the narrative of her life's incidents were not for the purpose 
of the artist herself's catharsis, but were tools for the audience's needs to be met. We not only had an emotional empathy for this teller's lived experience, but ownership of these elements in a way that was so generously handed over to us. The telling was about us, not her. The generosity of that act, the giving of this gift, activated us. We had to search ourselves for the meanings, consequences, insights, and growth. That became the sacred purpose of the ritual gathering, to hear the tale as a means of accounting for our lives. It was an act of redemption for us. This element, this generosity of focus, not on self, but the needs of others, was the essence of Philip's art. The very room we are gathered in now, the Philip Arnaud stage, um, is testament to this. Philip created this space, the Theater Project of Baltimore. It was his artistic project. Its purpose was not his own fulfillment. It was about his creation of a fertile context in which a theater maker or a group of makers could reach, could grasp, or could, or couldn't. In attempting this, catharsis was granted to those gathered as witnesses. Under the leadership, under his leadership, some of the most courageous, bold makers of the day amongst us found a place that eludes so many artists, a place that valued their experimentation and learning. My personal first substantive knowledge of him was naturally in the context of a controversy. Um, in 1990, the incident that became known as the scandal of the NEA4, which was in some ways the most recent manifestation of an ongoing national quest, the reaching of understandings, the battling of competing values, the searching for agreements that yield our comedy and define for the, the moment, for the moment, our democracy. This is the LA Times version of that moment. Philip Arnaud, chairman of the NEA review panel that screened 90 applications for solo performance fellowships and then recommended 18 proposed winners, said Frohmeyer, then the chairman of the NEA, appointed by George Bush I, notified him of the decision to approve only 14 grants and reject four. Arnaud is founder and artistic director of the Theater Project of Baltimore. I am convinced that Mr. Frohnmeyer has taken what he believes to be the only action open to him, said Arnaud. I believe that that decision on these four artists was based on perceived political realities, but I disagree with that decision. The larger debate on these issues will take place in Congress over the next weeks, and I'm personally saddened by the politicization of support for the arts in this country. I believe that terrible damage has already been done to these artists and to the endowment itself. When I finally did meet and engage with him around three or four years later, he was a hero to me, an exalted hero. Who knew his status would only grow exponentially in my mind? He had been fighting for artistic freedom, fighting for the arts to be central in our culture, something of primary importance to me. Uh, now this giant was inviting me as the artistic director of New York Theatre Workshop to join in the US Netherlands touring and exchange program. That was the beginning of my being in close proximity to the magnificence of Philip, a friendship sanctified collaboration that has lasted some 30 odd years and only ended in his passing, and maybe not. He was never front footed or self promoting. <laughs> uh, he was always there <laughs> behind the curtain, pulling the strings, wrangling to connect makers from multiple global cultures. He made the introductions, offered support when he could to any plans that might materialize. But like the time honored, culturally and historically ever present matchmaker, his reward was the bonds forged between others. His delight was to stand back and watch his beloved soar and glister. I have such a profound debt to this man. I think he saw in me something I couldn't, and he unlocked that part of me. And that was when he and I bonded. He was the one who made me realize that one of the most valuable outcomes derived from burying oneself in another culture was the clarity one had in looking at one's own cultural assumptions in given circumstances. I'll never forget on one of the most of the many trips we took together, this one to, was to the Netherlands, when I realized that Dutch and Flemish makers, actors, designers, directors, writers, made their work without ever having to even think of making their peace with the Broadway theater manifestation and experience the absence of those strictures, what a different kind of work could emerge. 
every single American artistic soul who sets out to be a theater person when they grow up ultimately must find rapprochement with the forces of Broadway sensibility. Embrace it because it's the only way one can actually be a professional in the practicing of your craft. Revolt against it in search of forms and aesthetics and doom yourself to poverty and obscurity. Or compromise, figure out your own uniquely cobbled together modus. But no one, no one in America could escape that foundational con construct. Embrace, revolt, evade, deny, compromise. I came to understand this art form evolved only by contending with the given circumstances, the prevailing rules and assumptions of any society. The decades of new cultural vistas that he gave me, the, that he illuminated and shared with me, we bonded in our not just love of, uh, but worship of food, <laughs> sour cherry soup in Budapest, sometimes darker sightings. He was my fellow traveler for the ritual I devised for my 50th birthday to visit a visit to Auschwitz. How many times we sat next to each other in theater seats in Romania, in Wroclaw, Krakow, Amsterdam, Ghent, Budapest, Groningen, Delft, Bulgaria. I do remember yet another staggering insight that his efforts brought to me. The metaphor I evolved to describe this was that of a lovely formal garden, fountains, statuary, rigorously manicured, Imagine Versailles or Fontainebleau, and at the very center of almost labyrinthine pathways into the center of this garden was a marble table. And on this table was a splendiferous bouquet of greenery and blossom, fragrant from plantings that were not derived from this garden. To my mind, that was the metaphor of what important institutions like BAM were doing for us back then, showing us the fruits and flowers of other gardens Species unknown or unfamiliar to us. But what I wanted, thanks to our mutual friend Philip, was for some of those seeds from that bouquet to find their way into our soil, and that the bouquet at the epicenter would start to be composed of both native and non-native plants, and that the bouquet would be ever-changing and not repetitive or easily characterized. This I understood from Philip, how, was how art forms grew, evolved, and changed. Philip, most of all, believed that he was that kind of gardener. And I think that's the word I've been searching, searching for to describe him. He's a gardener. The apparent glory of the first blush of rose blooms was to be theirs, not his. His reward was that he made beauty by putting seeds into fertile ground. He searched the globe in pursuit of soil, seeds, and like-minded gardeners. The joy and the beauty were the results in the sights, sounds, and scents that were the outcome of his efforts. Philip changed me. He awakened what was there in me and allowed me, as was my, his habit, to find my flowering. Most importantly, he changed the world. He schooled the gardeners from all corners of the globe in how to make their special and unique gardens, often in places they had never themselves imagined. And those gardens yielded sustenance, delivered cathartic vistas to a global citizenry. He gave of himself so others could bloom. Finally, I think I know now his name of his art form, Gardening the Gardener. Thank you. Hi, my name is Molly Smith, and I'm the Artistic Director Emeritus of Arena Stage. And one of the many who really were part of Philip Arnaud's posse. I'm speaking to you from Alaska at our cabin. You can see out here uh, how beautiful it is. It's the only thing that's stopping me from being there with you in person because I loved Philip. He took me all over the world from Hungary to Russia. And uh, Philip always had the greatest taste in artists. I first knew him from seeing what he did with the TNT Festival in Baltimore probably 35 years ago, 40 years ago. And then I traveled with him for around 20 years and set up wonderful collaborations with people like Janos Saz, uh, who I now have a long-term relationship with. So I think all of us can take his legacy forward by really continuing to create relationships with artists all over the world. And by creating relationships with all artists all over the world, 
we continue the brilliant work that Philip did because there will never be anybody like him. I love you, Philip. Much love to his family. Condolences to all of you for this great and deep loss of Philip Arnaud. Thank you. Hi, and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ruben Polendo. I'm the founding artistic director of Theater Me Too. I'm so sorry I can't be there in person. It really is an honor to be part of this celebration of life for our dear Philip. I cannot imagine my artistic life and my company's life without the presence of Philip. He was a true friend, a mentor, and just an inspiring human being who modeled a kind of bridge building that was so unique and so human. There are two things that come to mind in particular when I think of Philip. One was the first time that he saw Theater Me Too's work. He came up to me afterwards and he asked me, are you serious about this work? I don't know what he meant. I just remember feeling so nervous at this intense question. I pulled up my bootstraps and I said, yes, I'm serious. And he paused and he said, yeah, okay, you need to meet some people. You need to meet these people and that person and we need to get you there. I didn't even know where there was and before I knew it, I was on a trip to Romania that forever changed my trajectory as an artist, as a person and my relationship with collaborators all over the world. The second thing I think of is Soon after we got our new space here in Brooklyn, Philip made a special trip from Baltimore to come see the space. He walked in and I welcomed Philip and I said, Theater Me Too has a home, Philip. And he said, you know what you do with a home, huh? I paused and I thought, what, what is this again question from Philip? And he said, you welcome people. You welcome people into your home. And that's what we've been doing here at Me Too 580, Theater Me Too space. And I continue to be so grateful for Philip's influence, for his support, and for inspiring all of us to continue to build bridges, not just as artists, but as human beings. We will miss him so, so dearly. Thank you so much again for letting me join, and we send you so much love, Philip, and I know wherever you are, you're asking people, are you serious about this work, and you're building bridges. Thank you. Dear Philip, and dear friends of Philip, I, be, I believe that uh, the soul of Philip didn't fly away so far that uh, and uh, he can uh, hear me. I want to, to tell to Philip, Philip, uh, I love you, and um, without you, the wave of um, uh, orphanhood. I'm I'm not sure that I pronounce correctly. I write this word. Uh, uh, close over me and um, uh, I'm like without the, ch the child without Santa Claus when my friends in Moscow asked me who is Philip why are you talking about him so often uh, I explained that, that it's, uh, you are uh, Santa Claus Santa Claus, real Santa Claus Philip, I don't believe <laughs> I'm not a child I don't believe in Santa Claus but I believe you I believe you, and I remember how you looked the, the performances with so childish curiosity that um, it's lesson to me, to all my life, uh, to be open, to be kind, uh, and to try to help um, to help people in the theater, because theater uh, was your god, and you are um, you are the angel of of this god very important angel and you will lead me uh, all my life thank you very very much be with me this last one <clears throat> and this last one not unintroduced was dima krim uh, we'll just do a short call out to people who are connecting to us from different places uh, baltimore ashfield alaska atlanta brooklyn manhattan philadelphia new mexico memphis snow hill north carolina poland and lola writes here many other places uh, because there are 70 people watching and many haven't said where they're from <laughs> from ukraine oh thank you thank you for watching um, yes, thank you everybody who is joining us virtually. Uh, and now we have a performance from Alex and Olmsted, who is one of the beloved resident uh, artists here at the Baltimore Theater Project. Uh, 
hello everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Vernon. I'm Sarah Olmsted Thomas. Uh, together we run a duo puppet theater company called Alex and Olmsted, and we're also uh, company members of Happenstance Theater. We met Philip in 2013 when Happenstance Theater lost its venue in Silver Spring, and Chris Fingston invited us up to Theater Project to perform. Yeah, and uh, we've been performing here ever since. And every year, Philip would come to one of the shows, and it always felt like having a celebrity in the audience. Sitting in the front row, or second row up, as Chris pointed out, with his thousand watt smile, he was always the first to run up and greet us after a show and the last to leave the theater. Yeah. Uh, being a resident company at Theater Project has meant that we've gotten to build so much work and, and gotten to take it uh, around the, uh, the country. We make our living as theater artists and there's no question that it is our relationship with Theater Project that makes this financially viable and possible. Mm. Um, in fact, uh, this year we moved to Baltimore and uh, one of the last time, oh, thank you, yeah. <laughs> uh, and one of the last times we saw Philip and Carol was after one of our shows, sitting in their seats. And in fact, Philip said to me at that time, I love to see growth, which speaks so much to what Jim was sharing about being a gardener. And he and Philip brought us Welcome to Baltimore gifts. After that show, Carol gave us a beautiful book from a museum in the Netherlands that, to, that the two of them had visited, a museum dedicated to musical clocks and street organs, and Philip gave us a container of Old Bay <laughs> <laughs> that he had signed with his autograph. <laughs> so that'll be up for auction later. If, yeah. um, <laughs> um, Philip's vision with Theater Project has allowed so many different artists to create new and experimental new work in a safe environment. Uh, and we'd love to share a, a piece with you uh, that we performed here last at uh, BTP's 50th birthday, uh, at which Philip was proudly in attendance. Uh, and we'd like to share it with you now in his memory. <clears throat> uh, it's called The Bird Family Band. <clears throat> Well, good evening, folks. We are the Bird Family Band, all the way from Nashville, Tennessee, just uh, touring this great country of ours, uh, spinning yarns and uh, singing songs. And uh, we're just pleased as punch to be here in honor of Philip and to introduce to you the newest member of our family band, Baby Bird. Say hello, baby. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> and we just love to sing a little ditty for you. It's the Bird Family Band's signature family song, and we do hope you enjoy it. Ready, Mama? Ready, Papa. Ready, baby. <laughs> All right. Ah. Uh, now, what's that, baby? Oh. Uh, baby Bird says he won't sing the Bird Family Band's signature family song until he's had a snack. Uh, now, Mama, did you uh, bring a snack? Papa, I didn't. Oh, uh, I hate uh, posing in position. Does anyone here have... Um, uh, any bird food or a, a, a small nibble or no? Philip always had a little treat for baby bird. We, we wouldn't want to disrespect his. Uh, do you have a little bird snack on you? No. Oh, oh they, they're right there. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Oh, um, oh no no uh, up three three rows. Yep, there you go. Thanks. So. Oh, uh, baby bird's too little to eat solid food. If, uh, do you know how baby birds eat? <laughs> there it is. I'm just right into his mouth. All right, thank you so much. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> Feeding the youth of America. <clears throat> All right, thank you. So how was that, baby bird? All right. Ready, mama? Ready, papa. Ready, baby? All right. What's that, Baby Bird? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Baby Bird says he won't sing the Bird Family Band's signature family song until he tells you his favorite joke that he would always tell Philip. <laughs> Go ahead, Baby. <laughs> oh, uh, Baby Bird wants you to know that it's a knock-knock joke. Go ahead. Okay, 
I'll give it to you, baby. That is a good one. Ready, Mama? Ready, Papa. Ready, baby? All right. All right. Now, what is it now, baby bird? Oh. Baby bird says he won't sing the bird family band signature family song until he first sings for you the bird family band signature family song. Baby Bird, we are singing the Bird Family Band Signature Family Song. We're just having fun, folks. Ready, Mama? Ready, Papa? Ready, Baby? Take it away, baby bird. Let's see some of that good flat footing. That's my son. folks. We love you, Philip. Good night. I'm Juanita Rockwell. I write and direct operas, plays, and other sorts of performances. And I was the founding director of the experimentally focused MFA in theater program at Towson University, where I worked with Philip for a couple of decades. I was barely in my 20s and already obsessed with the experimental and international theater world when I first learned about what Philip and his collaborators were doing in Baltimore. Before and during my grad school, and then later as artistic director of my own theater, I'd drive down from Connecticut to see the work he was presenting. Bullock Polivka from then Czechoslovakia, India's Theater of Pune, Sweden's Yard Circus, Poland's Garjanitsa, and from the US, Spider Woman Theater, Fred Kerchak, Martha Clark, Urban Bushwomen, and so many others. So, although I hadn't heard of Towson University when I applied for a job there in 1993, <laughs> I was excited to accept the position once I saw Philip at the interview table and learned we'd be collaborating. I'm so grateful for all the cool things we did, including dozens of co-productions with Theater Project, a very early convening of what became the Network of Ensemble Theaters, and the ITITCG conference at Towson in 2000, featuring some of the folks who are speaking today. And of course, taking students to see the work of Varlakowski in Poland, Sass and Alfildi in Budapest, or seeing work by Krimov of Van Hove or Ernoff in the US, knowing the role that Philip played in their coming here. And there was another side of Philip. When I had spinal surgery, not long after I came to Towson, Philip called me a lot. How you doing, kid? Just got back from Nairobi, flying to Budapest tomorrow. And we'd talk about the work. Philip understood that the arts move forward when we see each other's work, talk about the work together, connect, build, 
and foster relationships around the world. So most of all, I'm grateful to Philip for those grad students. Now colleagues, friends, collaborators, whom I'd never have met if Philip hadn't been at that interview table. Thank you. So here we are in Buenos Aires, the city where Philip and I walked so many times since 1989. And from here, he helped me get to the United States first, and then he always pushed me to do things that they were not always comfortable for me. And in 1996, as I was working in a job he got me at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, he insisted that I needed to go on a tour with him. He took me to New York to see Pittsburgh, and in the end, insisted that I need to come to this place with him. And we took an Amtrak and landed at Springfield, Massachusetts, where I ended up coming to Double Edge Theater and meeting Stacy Klein. And now it's 28 years later. So I met Philip in helping Garjanitsa get to his Festival of the Nations. Um, and there's many stories about that, and everyone has many stories about Philip. And he brought Song of Absence to Baltimore Theater Project. And then, but I want to just say that the most important meeting that Philip conducted with me um, was bringing Carlos to the farm which changed my life and changed Double Edge. And Double Edge has been a partnership ever since then. And everything we've done about living culture and our justice and everything else is stems from that fatal meeting. And of course, both of our histories. So... Much to celebrate and to remember him. Thank you, Philip. Love you, Philip. My name is Jenny Larson, and I am one of the many artists that Philip took under his wing. Um, Philip, I met you in 2012, and you immediately saw a potential in me, and I am forever grateful. We bonded over being both artists and parents and the challenges that came with those two jobs that we both loved. Philip took me to Baltimore, Hungary, all over Russia. He introduced me to artists and thinkers that became my friends and collaborators that I have worked with over the years and continue to work with to this day. I wouldn't be the artist or the human that I am without him. Thank you, Philip. I am forever grateful. You will be missed. Hi there, my name is Jared Hansen. I was Philip's CITD fellow when I was here in grad school and have continued to stay in touch and work with him uh, since. But well before I uh, lived here or knew who Philip Arnaud was, my first time ever setting foot in Baltimore was touring a show with my company, uh, the Margolis Brown Adapters, right here at the Baltimore Theater Project. Um, and so it felt uh, a decade later when I moved here for grad school and I was interviewing uh, with Philip for the fellowship, it felt like the stars had really aligned because I learned then that back in 1984, Philip had worked with my mentor, Carrie Margolis of the company, to help produce their first show, Autobahn, right here in the Baltimore Theater Project. And so it really felt like um, cosmic serendipity that I went from one amazing mentor and gained another in Philip. And in true Philip form, I had been in Baltimore for maybe a week, if that, uh, when knowing my background and training, he invited me to 
sitting on a rehearsal uh, that Yuri was directing. And by the end of that rehearsal, I had become the movement director for that piece. <laughs> <laughs> And it sparked a friendship and artistic relationship that I just value so dearly. It was just so emblematic of Philip's way of navigating and connecting and being in relationship with people and art. Um, and in that spirit, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, whom I had the privilege of meeting and seeing his work when Philip brought me to Budapest in 2018, um, amazing artist Martin Boros. Thank you, Jared. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Martin Boros. I'm from Budapest, Hungary, the sour cherry soup country. <laughs> I'm a theater and film director, and we have always joked that Philip was my adopted grandfather, and I gladly accept it to be one of his many adopted grandchildren. I can relate to so many of those who spoke before me, especially with the double-edged theater folks. You will soon see why. Um, for the past decade, he followed my career and supported my theater company, Stereo Act, from the start. He attended both our fifth and tenth anniversaries. He watched all of our performances, even the ones without subtitles with unrelenting persistence and proudly claimed to be the only person on the planet who had seen our show Promenade live in Budapest, in Baltimore, and later in Albuquerque. The last piece we saw together was a Ukrainian play that he fostered and I hosted in Stereo Act's new space. I often wondered how one person could be so deeply rooted in so many lives with only one body and one life. He was a mentor to many, turning everything he touched into friendship, community, and family. He was, in essence, a matchmaker to me. He often talked about his favorite scene from Promenade Albuquerque a basketball game featuring a bride in a wedding gown who eventually became my wife. We owe our meeting to Philip. He wanted me to work and be happy in Budapest and help build community and the tradition there. And he also was just as worried about the worsening political situation in Hungary as I am. When he learned I was considering leaving, he fully supported my decision to make a major life change. His support was crucial to so many parts of my life and I'm so sorry he's not here to celebrate with me now that I have moved so close to his home. From him I learned the importance of being generous with our attention, curiosity and time. I will honor his memory by continuing his passion for theater bridging divides and fostering connections. Thank you, Philip, for letting me be your friend. Uh, listening to all these stories, I was just uh, reflecting on uh, one of the tributes or one of the conversations, many conversations I've had with people over the last couple of months is uh, that someone said that one of the hardest parts of Philip's passing is just feeling his absence, a, a surprise feel of absence. Um, and so I was feeling that, you know, on and off for the last couple of months. And then today, as I've been hearing all of these stories, both this morning and then this afternoon, it feels like his presence is actually in the connections between people. Um, and so I feel like I'm starting to feel his presence again in the ways that people are telling stories. And so I encourage you to keep him present by staying connected in the way that he always was sort of the fulcrum point of connecting with each other. And so with that, we're gonna have our final two video tributes before we go to the last portion. Um, one of them will be from one of my favorite playwrights, Maxim Koruchkin, who is in Ukraine. Uh, of course, I learned about his work because I was at Towson when we did the new Russian drama project and I had the honor of being in his show. Uh, a fair warning, it's got a swear word in it, vodka fucking in television uh, that Yuri directed and I became a, a fan of, of Maxim's uh, and he is now leading the theater of playwrights in Ukraine. Uh, and then following that, our last video will be from uh, two of Philip's closest confidants, I would say, slash conspirators, 
uh, Oksana Mycina and uh, her spouse John Friedman who recorded their tributes from their home in Greece. I am playwright. There is currently no light in the theater, the playwrights. Today, the Russians fired missiles at Ukraine again. But thanks to Philip, the lack of electricity is no longer a problem. Before the beginning of the theater season, we will connect a new diesel generator. I was introduced by Philip by John Friedman. I was a brash young playwright then. I didn't understand why there was anyone else in the theater other than the author of the play. Philip Laufer, he never argued with me. Now I understand what a naive fool I looked like. But one day Philip was close to exploding in anger. This happened when I ordered a well done steak. Not rare, not medium, well done. Philip could not accept this reality. Seriously, our theater exists because of Philip. He did everything to keep us alive. And now he's always with us. Thank you, Philip. Thank you to everyone who loved you. I think we can prove that we know how to be grateful. We love you. You are forever our close, selfless friend. Wow. Um... It's quite something to be together here with all of Philip's family and friends and colleagues and loved ones. Everybody, everybody's heart is filled with memories. Everybody's heart is filled with things they want to share. Uh, my wife, Oksana Moisina, and I are in Greece. We're on the island of Crete, and our hearts are full and have been ever since we lost Philip. Um, Oksana, yes. go ahead and say a few words um, about Philip for us. Of course. Um, I'm very happy to share some of my thoughts and memories about our dearest friend, Philip Arnaud, uh, because he was an amazing person. He gave this world so much of joy, so much of love, so much of his talent that we all were mm, surrounded with, the, with, with this, uh, his feelings of this world uh, all our life, I would say so, at least our professional life, because we know Philip for a long time and um, I couldn't uh, talk about him uh, in a past sense. So, <laughs> I, Philip, dear Philip, uh, we still remember your beautiful smile. Um, you are the best uh, person in the audience forever for me. Uh, you saved, uh, sometimes you saved some of my concerts. When you came and you were sitting on, on stage and I saw your face and I still remember these fantastic <laughs> feelings uh, of your big, big heart. Um, and uh, of course, um, I will never forget uh, that you, with your help, uh, me and Kama Gimkas went to Broadway uh, and played our Dostoevsky show uh, during um, more than a month. And it was such an experience. I will never, never forget it, dear Philip. So, mm, thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your mm, amazing temperament <laughs> and love to arts all over the world. Philip's temperament. Everybody remembers Philip's temperament. No one will ever forget Philip's temperament. Uh, if I were to say everything in my heart and my, my soul about Philip right now, we'd never leave. That's not possible. Philip and I worked together constantly from the year 2001 uh, until literally a, a week or two before he died. We worked on Russian case festivals in Moscow. Uh, we put together the Towson New Russian drama festival uh, together with, uh, obviously together with the, the faculty at Towson. 
uh, we put together the New American Plays for Russia project together with Michael Hurley at the American Embassy. These are all major projects that Philip and I did. We, when the war started in Ukraine, Philip and I immediately got in touch with each other and we both, we both admitted to each other that this work that we were doing with Ukraine was the most important work we had ever done. Philip in his 40 or 50 years, I in my 30 or 35 or whatever it is, maybe it's even 40 years now, God forbid, but um, we both felt that this was the most important work we'd ever done, bringing Ukrainian texts and bringing U Ukrainian plays to the world, supporting Ukrainian writers, supporting, uh, supporting Ukrainian culture at a time when Vladimir Putin uh, was declaring that there's no such thing as Ukraine, no such thing as Ukrainian culture, no such thing as Ukrainian uh, language. Uh, Philip and I worked very hard to bring as much Ukrainian literature, culture, and, and uh, uh, language to the world. Um, it was a, an honor, it was a joy to work with you, Philip. You know that. We, <laughs> we talked about that every time, every time we talked over the last two years. <clears throat> about what a joy and what an honor it was to do what we were doing. And I have to say one last thing. Philip and I met hundreds of times over the years, and we could never go 45 minutes without slipping into politics. We could never go 45 minutes talking just about theater or art uh, or our families. We had to. Within 45 minutes, we had to start trashing George Bush, trashing the war in Iraq, trashing Vladimir Putin, uh, and, and of course, uh, this is just the perfect time. As we're getting ready to uh, change America, we are going to do that, aren't we? We're going to do that in part for Philip. We're going to do it for ourselves and for Philip. Philip, I love you. I love you. I love you. Thank you for everything. You will be always, and you are always, in our heart. Thank you, dear friend. Thank you for everything. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Howard Shalwitz. Um, I'm the artistic director emeritus of the Woolly Mammoth Theater Company in Washington, DC. Um, but for the last five years, I've been an associate director of CITD. Um, since 2010, I've had the privilege of traveling with Philip many times to Hungary, Poland, Bulgaria, and Russia. And I, too, can say that those trips changed my life. Um, and for the past five years, I've been working with him on a project called Linkages Poland, um, which is building a new generation of relationships between theaters, theater leaders in the US and their counterparts in Poland. And I'm Brandis Thompson. I am a theater maker, educator, and the general manager at CITD. I first met Philip when I was one of Juanita's MFA students at Towson. And I began working for CITD right after graduation, which was the height of the pandemic. So instead of hopping on planes to meet other artists, we were logging into a lot of Zoom screens, uh, continuing to connect with people even when we couldn't travel. But since we have been able to travel in 2022, I've worked alongside Howard leading multiple delegations to Poland and I've helped oversee uh, some of the projects that John and Max were talking about centered around Ukrainian artists and others uh, centered around Hungarian artists. Um, well, Brandis and I have a, a very enviable job here today, um, which is to th say thank you to a whole bunch of great people. So we have to start off by thanking everyone who made today's event possible. Uh, thank you, Baltimore Theater Project, Chris Finkston, John McAfee back there in the tech booth. Thank you, Jared Hansen, for your technical expertise in stepping in to assist in a million different ways oh today God. and yesterday. <laughs> yes, thank you, Jared. <laughs> uh, thank you to our amazing live stream technical support, Bill Dixon, who's sitting right there, Mark Redfield, Jennifer Roos, 
all the incredibly patient and generous folks at HowlRound, especially VJ Matthew, thank you. Thank you to Nancy by Snack for the delicious catering. And I have to give a special shout out to Kevin Brown, who um, has, was a longtime friend and partner of Phillips. And it is with deepest gratitude I want to thank Phillips' family, his amazing daughter, Allison Van Pelt, Sean Brand, Michael Brand, Terry Brand, and the extended Arno Beige family. Thank you for sharing Philip and Carol with this world of theater artists who desperately needed them. And thank you to all of you who shared your stories here today. And for those of you who recorded video tributes on our tribute album, and for those of you who I know are gonna go home and record your own tributes on the album. So let's go all of them. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna try to I'm going to try to hold it together here. Um, as most of you know, Philip was um, addicted to traveling um, and to staying connected with an enormous circle of colleagues and friends around the U.S. and around the world. Um, but I have to say, over the past few years, this became more difficult because of his challenge. Oh, I've got to hold it together here uh, because of his challenges with mobility and other health issues. So there are several in individuals, in addition to Carol and their great family, um, who stepped up unselfishly to support Philip with daily tasks, correspondence, travel, um, and we want to give a quick shout out to just some of them. Um, I'm going to go through a quick list. Nicole Garneau, Jane Clark and Will Wadsworth, Ann Turiano, Melody Taylor, Blair Rubel, Jared Hansen, John Lesko, Lola Pearson, Natka Bianchini, John Wilson, Magojata Semmel, and of course the entire CID team based in Baltimore, including Susan, Yuri, and Brandis. I know that's just scratching the surface of the army of people who Philip called on to support him in those, um, in those challenging times, and I know firsthand uh, how much Philip appreciated all your efforts. Um, you made it possible for him to stay connected and productive through the very end of his life. Um, Philip always said he wanted to die on a plane. E everyone here has heard that. I know that. Um, most of you have probably heard him say he wanted to stop working only when they carried him out with a drool cup. Um, but thanks to all of you, he came awfully close to getting his wish. <laughs> And finally, we want to thank a number of close friends who uh, supported Philip, who uh, supported Philip and CITD these last few years, and uh, their support really allowed Philip to stay focused on the work that he believed in, which was connecting theater artists around the world. So, thank you, Barbara Lanciers from the Trust for Mutual Understanding. <laughs> Ben Pesner from the Venturous Theater Fund. I don't see you, but I know you're here. Uh, Scott and Evelyn Schreiber. Jeffrey and Mariko Ikahara. Bill Miller, Mary Catherine Bunting. Thank you, let's just give them all one final round of applause. And now I'm gonna invite Susan and Yuri back onto the stage. So uh, right now you are looking at the entire, mostly part-time CITD staff, and that includes John Friedman, whose video we watched at the very end. Uh, you know, Philip left huge shoes to fill, but we are committed to continuing his work, and it is more urgent now than ever. For instance, several months ago, we launched a new initiative called Linkages Ukraine, with two U.S. plays being staged in Kharkiv, Ukraine. And the reading sold out. The audience was packed, even though the performance had to take underground due to the missile strikes that were happening. And one of our collaborators was in the audience, and he said that the everyone in that room was incredibly moved, and that for just one moment. It felt like peacetime. And I'm getting emotional because <laughs> this was um, the last project that Philip was working on when he passed. So it is especially meaningful to us. 
But we are continuing this project in Ukraine and others. We're also continuing work that Philip started in Hungary and in Poland. And we're looking at other programs in other countries as well. So um, needless to say, we, um, we need your encouragement and your ideas and your support over the coming years to keep Philip's legacy going and to continue the work that he believed in. So as we're, we're gonna be involved in uh, kind of uh, reshaping our organization and our board, we're gonna be thinking about how we can best serve the field, we're gonna be reaching out to new artists at home and abroad. While we're doing that, please don't hesitate to contact us and share your thoughts. You are an incredible brain trust and we really would value conversations with all of you in this room that we can't fit in just today. Um, and if you're able to make a small gift in Philip's memory, um, there's a Philip Arno Memorial Fund. It will help us enormously as we move through this challenging transition to keep his work alive. So you can do that if you're interested on the CITD website or on the back of your program, there's a QR code that you can follow to, uh, to make your gift. So thank you, thank you so, so much. Ah. <laughs> We're moving into the immersive theater experience. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> Just you wait. Uh, Philip, <laughs> Philip, he would like always bring this, you know, new place he would go. He would bring a bottle of something, you know, something authentic, local. And then, you know, whenever, I actually wrote it down, when he, I, I felt like this bottles contained like concentrated essences of cultures Philip was in dialogue with. You know, you just take a sip, tiny sip of Unicum, and you're in Budapest, you know, extrapolate. And we thought, uh, he really thought uh, this last project of his with Ukraine was his main thing, right? So we, we found some Ukrainian pervak here, and uh, we, int we ask you all to actually come down here, come on stage, and have a drink. Please, come on up.
And before we toast, there is a song coming in. There is a song. Is this good? That'll do well. Yep. Yeah. Are you going to introduce me? Or what? What do you want me to do? Okay, everyone. Does everybody have something in their hand? We do have apple cider for those who need apple cider. Before we toast, so you can, you can lower your glass a little bit. Uh, we have, because it's theater, because it's a theater project, because it's Philip, we have a little bit of a spontaneous performance here. Joyce has offered to give us a song before Yuri leads us in a toast. Thank you. Uh, this song is dedicated, of course, to all of you and to Philip. Um, my show that just closed at the BMA was called Walk a Mile in My Dreams, but it was actually the visual personification of my performance here, my last one person, hubris laden <laughs> show called Walk a Mile in My Drawers. The ceremony really is to sing a uh, goodbye song at his home going. So I decided to do this one because I'm one of the kids who was born, left through Philip. I'm not scared of dying and I don't really care. If it's peace you find in dying, well then let my time be near. If it's peace you find in dying and if dying time is near. Then bundle up my coffin, cause it's cold way down there. <laughs> Troubles are many, they're as deep as a well. I can say there ain't no heaven, but I'll pray there ain't no hell, Philip. <laughs> I say there ain't no heaven, and I pray there ain't no hell. But I'll never know, by living only by dying will tell. Give me my freedom for as long as I be. All I ask of living is to have no chains on me. All I ask of living is to have no chains on me. And all I ask of dying is to go naturally out. I only want to go naturally. And when I die, and when I'm gone, there'll be one child born. I'm one of those kids who was born. There'll be one child born left, Philip, to carry on. Oh, 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 oh. 